tonight, the Canadians on board. So it was three generations. I lost three generations. An Ontario family of six is among those killed in the Ethiopian Airlines disaster. Plus, what Canada says about the Boeing planes in our skies. And it's very important not to jump to any conclusions. We're in Ethiopia with the latest on the investigation. And what went wrong for Tina Fontaine? We're people too, you know. We're not just pieces of trash you can throw away. Will the hard lessons from her death help save the lives of other young Indigenous girls? And a royal celebration with the next generation. Why Harry and Meghan made a stop at Canada House. This is The Next. There is a lot we don't know about Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302, a lot you might not even want to think about. But tonight, we are learning some hard details about the crash that killed 157 people, about the plane, and about the victims. Six people from Brampton, Ontario, all from the same family, died on that plane. In total, 18 Canadians were on board. You'll hear some of their stories tonight. There's also more about the uncertainty now swirling around the Boeing 737 MAX 8s, the same kind of plane that crashed near Jakarta last October. Tonight, we'll talk about the airlines now grounding them and why many are still flying them. But first, the latest from Addis Ababa and the search for clues about what happened in the six minutes between takeoff and tragedy. Susan Ormiston has the details of the disaster. On the African plane, gouged open by a diving airliner, investigators work to answer the most urgent questions, how and why. And whether this tragic scene connected to another precipitous crash less than five months ago. Gadisa Benti saw the plane hovering over his house Sunday, struggling with altitude. Then, nose down, tail in flames, he says it plunged. Pressure is intensifying on Boeing. Ethiopian Airlines grounded the rest of its 737 MAX 8 planes today. The incident was related with defects on this specific fleet. But we have taken this as an extra safety precaution. At least 24 airlines did the same, many of them in China, which ordered the entire MAX 8 fleet out of the skies. Air Canada, WestJet and Sunwing kept them flying, insisting confidence in Boeing's safety record, backed up by Transport Canada. Flight data and cockpit recorders were recovered, partly damaged but holding tight their clues. U.S. investigators have joined the Ethiopian Aviation Authority slowly piecing together the mystery. And away from the crater, the painful forever. A young airline crew, gone. An experienced young pilot with 8,000 flying hours with his inexperienced co-pilot only 200 hours. That will be a question on training, too. There are two difficult jobs here now. One, a forensic investigation, and two, the recovery of 18 Canadians and 139 other lives lost just six minutes after takeoff. We know from previous catastrophic airline crashes, like in Ukraine, that the grieving is prolonged because it's so hard to positively identify from the scene who was on that flight. And part of the recovery now will be to collect little bits of people's lives. Shoes, documents, passports, journals, things that may be treasured by those left behind. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Addis Ababa. We now know a little bit about almost all of the Canadian victims. It is a long and wrenching list of good people gone. They include passionate young environmentalist Angela Rayhorn, a recent Dalhousie grad, Micah Meesent from Vancouver Island, and Danielle Moore from Toronto. Also on that plane, Amina Ibrahim Odoa and her five-year-old daughter Sophia, who were going to see family. So was Derek Wuyi from Calgary. Carleton University professor Pius Adesanmi was flying in for an African Union conference. Jessica Haiba worked for the UN Refugee Agency in Somalia. Stephanie Lacroix from Timmins worked with the United Nations Association in Canada, according to her LinkedIn profile. 
Darcy Belanger was heading in to attend the United Nations Environment Assembly. Peter DeMarsh from New Brunswick was going to attend a workshop. And then there was this family from Brampton, Ontario. Two teen girls and their parents who were also traveling with their grandparents. In their deaths, we're getting glimpses into many of their lives tonight, including that family who had boarded that plane together to live out a dream. Olivia Stefanovic with what we're learning about the Canadian passengers. At around 6.37 a.m., I got the confirmation that uh, it's, uh, it's the news are true that my six family members, they're, they're, I, they're no more. For Manant Vadia, the crushing news came on a Sunday morning half a world away. My parents, their, their kids, my, my uh, sister and their kids. So it was three generations. I lost three generations. His sister, Kosha Vadia, her husband, Prerat Dixit, their teenage daughters, Ashka and Anushka, were headed for a trip of a lifetime to Mombasa, Kenya. He says Prerat worked two jobs to save enough money to take his family on a safari along with his parents, Panagesh and Hansini. They even didn't reach to Kenya. My in-laws are like my great support. And I, I can't think even live without them. Another Canadian, Jessica Haiba, was a mother of two, who worked for the UN High Commission for Refugees in Mogadishu. One of the toughest people I've met in environments like this and truly was, was a humanitarian warrior. I am in Washington, D.C. on a layover on my way to Kenya today. Like many passengers, Darcy Belanger was on his way to a United Nations environmental conference, championing the cause of Arctic marine life. He recorded this video during one of the last days he was alive. Uh, I'll check in again. We don't know where I'll be, maybe Ethiopia, maybe my final destination, Kenya, but I'll keep you posted on the journey. Have a great day. Bye. Inside Ottawa's Carleton University, candles flicker outside the office of a beloved professor. I wish Pius nice soul rest in peace. Naduko Ochiono remembers his friend of 25 years as having a magic for connecting with people. And at six feet two, he says Pius Adesanmi was larger than life. Physically, you know, you couldn't miss him in the first instance. And then he had a whole lot of wits, you know, with him and had a lot of humor and had a lot of life, which is why it's so difficult to come to terms that he isn't just coming back here. A fact many will have to wrestle with in the coming days as more Canadians are identified and honored. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. So many just beginning this terrible grieving process, but again, one family losing six members. This is really hard to process. Yeah, and it's made all the more difficult because no one has a clear idea of what mm -hmm. actually happened, right? I mean, the cause of Sunday's crash, still a mystery, but there are some really odd similarities between it and that Lion Air crash in October, Susan mentioned earlier. Let's compare the two. So. Yesterday, an almost brand new Boeing 737 MAX 8 takes off from Addis Ababa. It climbs to 8,000 feet above sea level, struggling to maintain altitude. It suddenly dips about 400 feet, then climbs again to 8,600 feet, airspeed fluctuating. Six minutes after takeoff, contact is lost. Now let's go back four and a half months. Again, a brand new 737 MAX 8 takes off from Jakarta. It climbs to roughly 5,000 feet. It too struggles to maintain airspeed and altitude. The plane's nose repeatedly dips 11 minutes after takeoff. Contact is lost. So same Boeing model, similar turn of events, which has raised questions about this aircraft itself. Paul Hunter now with more on the plane. For the specific model of jet in question, Boeing and U.S. regulators tonight noted what they're calling a software enhancement for the entire fleet of jets and fresh crew training is coming in the weeks ahead. But on American tarmacs today was business as usual for the airlines who fly those jets. Indeed, as well for Air Canada and its MAX 8s and WestJets, still flying with confidence.
I would, without any hesitation, uh, board uh, an aircraft uh, of that type at this, at this particular moment in time. Underlining the safety of air travel broadly, Transport Minister Mark Garneau today said Canada will follow the U.S. lead and keep its MAX 8s in the air while investigators seek answers in Ethiopia. We have the black boxes. It's important for us to determine the cause and then to take the necessary action, and we will do so. It's a different view for more than 20 airlines around the world, among them Air China, who've now grounded theirs. Mindful of that other MAX 8 crash off Indonesia last year that killed everyone on board amid what some say is a similar set of circumstances. In fact, tonight, Boeing cited that crash as a factor in developing its new software now set for the entire MAX 8 fleet. Still, in airports today, no matter the aircraft, passengers seemed unworried from Calgary. It's a terrible, terrible thing that happened, but it's not going to change what we do. To Halifax. So I feel safe, even though sometimes crazy stuff happens, but more often than not, like, it's still one of the safest ways to travel. To San Francisco. Uh, well, what are the odds of it happening again? Key to next steps, what investigators learn in Ethiopia. One of the investigators of the Swiss air disaster off Nova Scotia today highlighted questions about that other MAX 8 crash off Indonesia. If there's a direct connection between this one and the, and the previous one in October, I think you'll see a lot more people coming out in favor of this airplane should be grounded until we figure out what's going on. For now, that's the problem. No one can yet say what made this happen. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. So there is uncertainty, absolutely. But also consider the other part of the bigger picture, billions of dollars on the line. Boeing is the world's largest airplane manufacturer, facing serious questions about one of its most important products. Our Peter Armstrong now with the reaction inside the industry. The 737 MAX 8 is the world's best-selling modern passenger aircraft. It burst onto the scenes in 2017 in response to a new Airbus model that promised better fuel efficiency. Some critics say the plane came to market without adequate testing of its new software, but airlines were attracted to the savings it would bring. This is how many were in the air during a typical afternoon last week. And even with more than 20 airlines grounding their fleets, this is how it looked today. Canada is the second largest customer in the world for this plane. Air Canada has 24 in use, with another 18 to come this year. WestJet has 13, four of which were imported since the Lion Air crash in Indonesia in October. Even Sunwing has four. Well, I think they're here to stay in the sense that they're very fuel efficient, they're quiet, they're at the cutting edge, and this is a brand new aircraft. And of course, they're adding it to the fleet now. While the industry itself remains confident in the aircraft, two crashes in a matter of months have left investors concerned. Boeing stock fell 12% after the Ethiopian flight went down. Some of that already bounced back. But since the launch of the 737 MAX 8, Boeing stock has soared more than 200%, largely based on the confidence the industry showed in this plane. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. And Ian, Boeing corporate is obviously working hard on communications with investigators and employees. The company telling them tonight it remains committed to improving this plane. All right, Andrew, here are some of the other stories that we're watching tonight. The SNC-Lavalin controversy is now on the radar of a major intergovernmental body. The OECD, an international economic group, says it's concerned about allegations of political interference in the company's criminal case. It's told the Prime Minister's office it's keeping a close eye on the investigation. The Venezuelan opposition leader, Juan Guaido, called for a state of emergency today as the country goes through its fifth day of a major blackout. Schools and businesses were shut down, water pumps aren't working. The opposition is blaming government incompetence and corruption, while the president, Maduro, says the U.S. is behind the outage. An emotional reunion in Indonesia as one of the two women accused in the killing of North Korean's leader's half-brother was freed today. This comes after prosecutors in Malaysia unexpectedly dropped the murder charge against her. 
Kim Jong-un's estranged half-brother died after being smeared with a nerve agent at the Kuala Lumpur airport two years ago. The other accused, a woman from Vietnam, remains in custody. Theresa May and her Brexit deal face a crucial vote tomorrow in the British Parliament. The Prime Minister was in France today, hammering out last-minute legal changes to her plan to leave the European Union. Tomorrow, the House of Commons will debate the improved deal that these legal changes have created. I will speak in more detail about them when I open that debate. The European Union says that's it. There will be no more negotiating. The opposition leader, Jeremy Corbyn, is calling on MPs to reject the plan tomorrow, saying it still doesn't go far enough. As it stands, Britain is set to pull out of the EU in just 18 days. The uncertainty has been stressful, even agonizing for some British businesses, including lamb producers whose position is especially dire. Thomas Dagler tells us why. It's feeding time at the farm. Yes, that's as exciting a moment as any when you're a sheep. But these aren't just any old sheep. They're specially fed, specially grown females, all ready to give birth within days. It's lambing season here, and yous can tell. Just look at the size of those udders. Farm manager Kevin Harrison is getting ready as best he can. You know, normally we knew where we were going and where our lambs were going, but um, at the moment we haven't got a clue. As cute as they may be, lambs are born and raised here with one purpose, to be sold for their meat, considered a delicacy by lamb eaters in Britain and abroad. This little lamb was born premature, born a week ago. Normally, it could be processed for meat within six months, and much of that meat could be exported to the European mainland. But this year, there's a big question mark over the industry because of Brexit. With Britain leaving the European Union so far without a divorce deal, farmers are bracing for trade barriers, wondering if they'll even be able to sell this year's lambs. Although we eat them, you know, we're quite attached to our flock. Farmers might have to try and sell them or slaughter them. You know, that's, that would be the worst case scenario. He's not the only one letting out frustration. Drop by this livestock market in Oxfordshire for a sense of how big the British lamb industry really is and how much it stands to lose over Brexit. We knew it wouldn't be, but it sounded easy. Um, but we didn't realize we've had as many problems. All counted, there's about a thousand mature lambs here today. Most about a year old, all up for auction. For buyers, the age of the sheep is a major consideration. A few weeks older and they can't be sold for lamb meat, making farmers particularly vulnerable to even a short disruption in their trade. Worst case scenario is if we come out of Europe without a deal, um, on the 30th of March, there's a 40% tariff on lamb, and it will, it will stop lamb exports to Europe. Farming requires special skills and patience. <laughs> Greg Masters knows that more than ever, recently taking over the family farm just as Brexit looms. Now I'm stuck with not knowing what's around the corner, which in a way is quite worrying. But. Um, I would still vote leave, I think. <laughs> Farmers are demanding compensation if a no-deal Brexit forces down sales or even leads to a lamb cull. Britain may be leaving the EU, but no one seems to know where they're actually going. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, North Stoke, England. So what's next for Theresa May and Brexit? There are two paths. If May wins tomorrow's parliamentary vote on her exit deal, the United Kingdom will leave the European Union on March 29th. Most protocols, like customs rules, will stay as they are until December 2020, while both sides hammer out a permanent trade deal. If May loses, it gets complicated. Either the UK crashes out of the EU on March 29th without an exit agreement, or the departure date is delayed. In both cases, expect a lot more uncertainty and stress. 
Still to come, five years after Tina Fontaine was murdered, a new report is about to detail how the system failed the Indigenous team. Plus, a new tool in the operating room. Does it make more sense for robots to do the cutting? But first, Canada House rolls out the welcome mat for a couple of royal visitors. Britain's politicians may have spent the day squabbling about Brexit, but the royals were in full meet-and-greet mode for Commonwealth Day. About a quarter of the world's countries are members, and the Queen wants them to stay in the fold, so she's getting a new generation of royals involved. As Kayla Hounsell tells us, that youthful charm offensive was on display at Canada's High Commission in London today. <laughs> An enthusiastic Canadian welcome for the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Laura, I'm Meghan. Nice to meet you. Laura. Inside Canada House, <laughs> Prince Harry and Meghan wearing Canadian designer Erdem met with Canadian artists, entrepreneurs, and academics. When we spoke to their Royal Highnesses team about an event for the Commonwealth, we thought, what a wonderful way to celebrate uh, both our goals of, uh, of celebrating Canadians, but also their interest in youth. We have a partnership with the Met Police. Jillian Kowalczyk was pleased to tell the Duke and Duchess about her work on a navigation app to help people find safe routes home. It was quite an extraordinary honor to be able to present to them. Uh, Meghan Markle is very much, um, you know, an inspiration. Harry and Meghan were also treated to a performance by Indigenous throat singers. This is mine. It's, be it's better than sugar, right? Yeah. Yeah. They spent time with Canadian children at a makeshift maple sugar shack. This is a great way to start the day. And these are Manitoba muffins. And they were given gifts for their own child expected this spring. After their visit to Canada House, Harry and Meghan joined the Queen and other members of the royal family for the annual Commonwealth Day service at Westminster Abbey. As a founding member of the Commonwealth, Canada was at the front of the flag procession. Christian Norton, who's studying at the University of Oxford, was the flag bearer. I think it's quite an honour to be representing your country and also being someone from Prince Edward Island. It's not often that you see people from the island um, on these international stages or platforms. The Commonwealth countries have a combined population of 2.4 billion people. More than 60% of them are under the age of 30. And the Queen is giving the young royals more responsibility. Harry is the president of the Queen's Commonwealth Trust, which exists to champion, fund, and connect young leaders around the world. And Meghan has just been appointed vice president. Youth is crucial. The Queen gets that. And she knows that for the Commonwealth to survive and stay relevant, it's got to appeal to young people. Hardman says the Commonwealth is an important part of the Queen's legacy, and she's now beginning to entrust it to a new generation. Kayla Hounsell, CBC News, London. And still to come on tonight's national robot assisted surgery in the operating room. These instruments bring precision. Yes. Do they bring problems too? But next, five years after her death, a crucial report is about to shed new light on how 15 year old Tina Fontaine ended up murdered. The way that Tina was failed is the way that many kids in Manitoba are being failed right now by the child welfare system, by the police force, by our medical system. <laughs> I lost one son, but I gained, I want to say, a million. That is the mother, mother of a murdered CFL player, Calgary Stampeder Mylan Hicks. Her son's killer was convicted today. Hicks was shot and killed outside a Calgary nightclub in September of 2016 as the team gathered to celebrate a win. The prosecutor said this murder, quote, almost fits the definition of senseless. I have no relationship whatsoever with the Premier or the Ford family. I have not met the Premier before. The Government of Ontario has named a new OPP Commissioner just five days after the Ford government's first pick, Ron Tavener, withdrew his name from consideration. 
Thomas Carrick currently serves as the deputy chief for the York Regional Police. This comes after months of controversy and an integrity commissioner investigation following the appointment for Ford's friend to the job. And Parks Canada is looking at a staggering $12 billion repair bill. A new report says 40% of assets like buildings, bridges and historic sites across the country are in poor or very poor condition. The agency has already said that as of next year, five locations, including Citadel Hill in Halifax, that were previously free will have admission fees. Tina Fontaine lived for only 15 years. Her body, wrapped in a duvet cover and weighed down by rocks, was pulled from Winnipeg's Red River in the summer of 2014. Now, nearly five years later, we are about to learn new information about what went wrong in the days, months, and years before her death. That will come from the Manitoba Advocate for Children and Youth, who is set to release a report tomorrow. You see, Fontaine was a ward of Child and Family Services when she died, and many believe it failed her over and over again. Her death sparked grief, but something else too community action to hopefully prevent anything like that from happening again. Katie Nicholson explains. All right, let's get to work. We're already late. There we go. Most times when we see overflowing garbage bins, there's usually syringes associated with them, so that's why we pay attention to it. But quite frankly, just about everywhere in our community now, you'll find that kind of stuff. There are nicer ways to spend a hot summer evening, but James Favel can't sit back and relax. Favel heads up the Bear Clan Patrol, which walks Winnipeg's roughest neighborhood, cleaning it up and offering hope and even a little candy to people who call it home. Orange for your shirt. That one kind of matches you. Tonight, they're also looking for a missing teen girl. Missing girl, right? Looking for her tonight. She's new, eh? Yeah. Just, today. just this morning. Yeah. This is exactly why they're here. This bear clan was brought to life by the death of another missing girl. At approximately 1.30 p.m., a body was recovered from the Red River near the Alexander Docks. At this Winnipeg time, police confirmed late today that Tina Fontaine's remains today. were pulled from the water at the Alexander Docks. And police say the death is a homicide. Tina Fontaine. It's been five years since the 15-year-old girl's body was pulled from the Red River. It wasn't the first death along these shores, but it's the one that shook a nation to its core. Long before she became a poster child for missing and murdered Indigenous women, Tina Fontaine was just a little girl. <laughs> this is the Tina her family remembers, sharing for the first time what few videos they have of her. Fontaine grew up on Saguin First Nation, raised by her great aunt, Thelma Favel. Life with the Favels was happy and loving. And so was Tina. We are pretty, smart, gorgeous. Her Facebook littered with sweet messages to friends and laughter, something her great aunt, Thelma Favel, misses the most. <laughs> <laughs> and like it was like a little machine gun and that's how her grandma laughed too like she had my sister's laugh while the Favels were family Tina Fontaine craved a deeper bond her biological father was murdered she desperately wanted to connect with her mother in Winnipeg who was getting her own life back on track and uh, I told her if your grades are good you can go and she just aced everything math science everything she aced so um i had to hold my end of the bargain up and tell her like you know let her go and she for a week she was only supposed to go for a week but within days of arriving in the city her mother spiraling back into addiction kicked the 15 year old out onto the street reports were filed with child welfare and police both would fail to bring her to safety. She was flagged. So when a child is flagged, they're supposed to keep her. But they let her go. What is believed to be Fontaine's last 24 hours might best be described as a cascade of failures. 
beginning here on the Winnipeg streets she came to know so well that summer. Witnesses place her here in the West End area, downtown, before she's picked up by a man in a truck. Police soon pulled them over here, in an isolated industrial area of the inner city. The man behind the wheel has a suspended license. He's taken into custody. As for Fontaine, there's a missing persons alert on her name. Police never see it. They drive away and leave the 15-year-old on the side of the road. It's 5 a.m. 9.55 a.m., cameras pick Fontaine up at this parking lot several kilometers away. She's staggering, exhausted. She passes out between two cars. A security guard calls an ambulance. 11.20 a.m. at the Health Sciences Center, doctors examine Fontaine. She's underweight. Traces of alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, and other substances are in her body. Still within hours, she is released. 3.51 p.m. A social worker drops Fontaine off at this downtown hotel where the province's overtaxed child welfare system places kids in crisis because there is simply nowhere else for them to go. She makes her way to her room alone, but she doesn't stay, and workers don't stop her. For the third time that day, she slips away. Despite coming into contact with police, doctors, and a social worker, all within a 24-hour period, every last one of them fails to throw her the lifeline she needs. After all of that, she disappears. Nine days later, her body is pulled from the Red River, wrapped in a duvet cover. A tragic death that not only broke a community's heart, but set it on fire. When Tina Fontaine's body was found, that was, that was it. It was just the switch was flipped and it was time to do something. We needed, we needed boots on the ground, we needed bold action, we needed it now, we couldn't wait anymore. anymore. Um, you know, we, it, 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 was, it, it needed to be done now. Five years after Fontaine's death, those on the ground, like Michael Champagne, say very little has changed. Every week, he leads the conversation here at the bell tower in the heart of the inner city. The way that Tina was failed is the way that many kids in Manitoba are being failed right now by the child welfare system, by the police force, by our medical system. And I think that the way that any system is able to continue in this way is when those that are in positions to help look in the other direction. And they say, not my problem. Now, people like Champagne are making it their problem. Here at the bell tower. What can I do? Um, what can each of us do to address these systems that are no longer serving us? to receive timelines with your case plan. Yes, that is actually real. And here at Fearless R2W, a group that takes its name from the postal code of one of Winnipeg's poorest neighborhoods and challenges the child welfare system to make positive change. It's everyone's problem. And if you see something, then you have an obligation and a responsibility on a human level, not even related to your job or the system, on a human level to do what you can to make things better. Sometimes making things better is as simple as making a sandwich. Alexi Legere prepares food for every Mama Bear clan walk. Thank you for coming. Our elder is gonna lead us in our prayer tonight. Run by the mothers and grandmothers of the inner city, Mama Bear clan takes a nurturing approach to the streets. We all know that it's being the love, seeing the love, feeling the love, right? So that's the premise of the walk. It's why we do what we do. When they're on the street, you don't know where you can go for help. So that's why we come to them. And we do what we do now to, to try and make their lives a little bit easier when they're on the street. Legere sees a lot of herself in Tina Fontaine. She knows firsthand what it's like to be young, homeless, and alone. My situation, there was a lot of older men that took advantage of me not having anything because I didn't have food, I didn't have money. So they, they prey on girls, and they prey on mostly Aboriginal girls because they know that uh, they, a lot of them don't have family to turn to for help. On these nights, at least, people in need can turn to the Mama Bear clan for help. What happened to Tina Fontaine? Always in the back of Legere's mind, pushing her to do more. 
the police didn't do enough. They didn't. They weren't out there looking how we look. Like when we have a missing person, we're on the street. We're looking in dumpsters. We're looking in back alleys. We're looking everywhere. So I feel like the system just let her down in that aspect. There was no one there to protect her. For Samantha Chief, Mama Bear Clan isn't just about stepping up. It's about honoring what Tina Fontaine's story did for other Indigenous women. She finally opened a lot of people's eyes, you know, to all the bad things that happened to us Aboriginal women, you know. We're, we're people too, you know. We're not just pieces of trash you can throw away. <laughs> we have value to others. We're not... We're not who they portray us to be. We're not all street walkers. We're not trying to just do this because it's our choice, you know? It's just we're people. We need to be honored and loved just like regular people too, you know? Social worker Mitch Bourbonaire also helps Mama Bear Clan. He's watched a community tired of being failed by the system create its own. Our systems are top-heavy with bureaucracy and policy and procedure, and it takes a long time to get things done. Well, we don't have time. With, with children like Tina, we don't have time. We got to get out on the streets. We got to look for people. We got to bring people hope. All of this, the banding together, the planning, connecting, protecting a community because of a little girl lost in a system that didn't work. You should hang out again whenever this happens again. Whenever the siege sees you. So Katie, looking ahead to tomorrow's report on what went wrong for Tina Fontaine, you've spoke to someone who knows some of what's in it. What should we expect? Well, that's right. Thelma Fable, Tina's great aunt, who you heard from in our doc, already knows what's in the report. The advocate briefed her last Wednesday, and Fable says what we're going to hear tomorrow morning is going to be heavy and heartbreaking. Fable says she learned new things about how the system turned Tina away, and she says its contents are, quote, awful, and included new information about how troubled Fontaine's biological parents were. Fable said she needed to smudge several times with sweet grass to help her get through the delivery of that report. And what are Indigenous leaders looking for in this report tomorrow? Well, the majority of children in Karen, Manitoba, like Tina, are Indigenous. Former MKO Grand Chief Sheila North says she hopes that the report advocates for more counselling, more financial help for vulnerable women, and more culturally appropriate supports for kids in care, and an emphasis on keeping them in their community. Here's Sheila North. There are gaps and there are holes in the system that need to be filled and they can only be filled by the community themselves. Um, because if we don't uh, fix them, we're gonna see generations upon generations of, of people like Tina Fontaine that, have, that fall through the cracks and, and actually get, get, get killed. Now, North says, if nothing else, this advocate's report will help put Tina's name on something she hopes will make positive changes. Okay, thanks very much, Katie. You're welcome. Up next on The National, the doctor's dilemma, when that helping hand in the OR is a robot. We haven't found that cure rates are higher with the use of the robot. And then this week, The National is going to be looking at the future of cities, where we live and how we live. Here's a preview of what we'll have tomorrow. This is Forest City. One of the world's boldest new city projects, a gated city planned for 700,000 people on land that simply didn't exist a few years ago. Four artificial islands right next to Singapore, Southeast Asia's strongest economy. It's a big bet meant to benefit all, but will it? All of these towers are basically investment vehicles, I would say. For, for foreign investors, particularly for Chinese investors. They're trying to attract some residents by saying this is a clean and green and safe environment. It just makes us think the future is beautiful and it's clean and it's all possible. That is, of course, the official pitch.
It's a technique that has revolutionized the medical industry, robots. They can help perform surgeries. These machines have been used in hospitals across North America for nearly two decades, but it's just in the last month that Canada saw its first robotic knee surgery. But innovation has not always gone smoothly. Last month, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration issued a warning about using robots in some cancer surgeries. And in Ontario, there's a fight over public funding for some procedures. So, where are we at? The CBC's Christine Burak has the latest. The sound might be jarring, but orthopedic surgeon Dr. Anthony Adili is in awe. He's holding a robotic arm that's cutting into his patient's knee, a procedure he's done hundreds of times. But for the first time, he's mostly watching. I will only cut it based on where we've modeled it. The robotic arm precisely chisels each bone so that surgeons can cap it with a knee implant. I'm walking fine, I'm walking straight. I'm great, I'm so thrilled. Just a small part of Peter Sporta's knee was damaged, but Adili says most surgeons would have done a full knee replacement to lower the risk of complications. Robotic assisted surgery makes partial replacements easier by reducing the risk of a bad cut. The biggest difference is the ability to accurately get the alignment of the implant exactly where you want. More accurate, smaller incisions, less blood loss, quicker recovery times are all points used to sell robotic surgical devices. American hospitals quickly bought into the marketing nearly 20 years ago and did so without much evidence potentially putting patients at risk. Newer doesn't always mean better. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration recently warned about using robotic assistance in some cancer surgeries. Researchers found some women with cervical cancer who had minimally invasive, usually robotic procedures, may not live as long as those who underwent a traditional surgery although it's not entirely clear why. For many procedures and many diseases, there isn't long-term data that's available to either prove the safety of robotic surgery or demonstrate that it's superior to other alternatives. Canadian hospitals that have purchased these multi-million dollar devices have largely done so with private money. But an expert committee in Ontario actually recommended against funding the most popular robotically assisted surgery for prostate cancer. We haven't found that cure rates are higher with the use of the robot. And then, of course, we look at things like complications. And with prostate surgery, the big complications are uh, urinary dysfunction and sexual dysfunction. And again, there's no good evidence that using the robot reduces the rates of those complications. Add to that, robotically assisted procedures often take longer to do and on average cost over $3,000 more per patient. Dr. Adili and his team are now gathering evidence for this new robot and an old one by conducting randomized trials. So that way we can definitively answer these questions so we can say to the payer, there is advantage for this technology, for this subgroup of people, and these are the outcomes you can expect. That's the discussion we need. We're not there yet. But from what he's seen so far, Sporta is sold. Christine Birak, CBC News, Hamilton, Ontario. And our moment is coming up. How a tragic plane crash in Ethiopia became a global one. And I now invite all representatives to stand and observe a minute of silence in honour of the victims. I have my kids tonight, but I can find a sitter, or I could just give them a couple knives and let the best man win. I'll be there, I'm gonna go. When a plane goes down, it can affect the whole world. It certainly did this weekend. So many nationalities on board that Ethiopian Airlines flight. Some on March break, some traveling for work, some just so anxious to see family. Those who were lost are on the minds of so many tonight in so many different parts of the world. These expressions of global grief mark our moment. This is indeed a sad day for many around the world and for the UN in particular. I invite you all to Who 
his laugh was just so characteristic and you can still hear it in the halls and in the tunnels and he's it's a really really big loss like i don't think words can explain how big of a loss this is anyway the world takes the good people first that is what i believe so, you know, this is a really hard one today, right? Because there aren't enough words, or certainly aren't enough of the right words to describe what people are going through. And every time we learn a few more details about people's lives, it, it gets harder. Incredibly, 35 different countries were represented on that plane. And it's Kenya. We're talking a lot about Canada today, but it's Kenya that, that lost the most people, 32. Yeah, and it's in Nairobi, Kenya, where we saw that scene with a minute of silence and, and where so many people on that plane were heading for a UN environment conference. And that conference issued a statement today saying, we've lost many defenders of peace, environment, culture, humanity. Let's honor them by making our world a better place for all. Let this be the spirit of the UN Environment Assembly starting today. Every one of these faraway tragedies, whether it's a, a crash or a mudslide or an earthquake, it, they, all, every one of these deaths is tragic. But boy, there sure is something about the connection to Canada, which we've seen here. And all those bedrooms and offices, those homes where people thought they were going to be back in a week or two. But uh, in many cases, they'll never be back. Mm -hmm. That is The National for this Monday, March the 11th. Good night. Good night.